we're coming to a close in uh, Matthew. I'm going to miss Matthew, you know what? Um, Matthew chapter 28, we're looking at the first 15 verses this morning. Our message is the king's resurrection. And if you've been with us in Matthew's gospel, so far we've seen the king revealed, the king resisted, the king retreating, the king rejected, the king crucified, and now we come to the king resurrected. And that's really the message of the gospel, isn't it? It's the resurrection of Christ and the hope that that brings. And that's why Peter the apostle wrote and said in 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's also the resurrection of Jesus Christ that guarantees our resurrection. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. Speaking of the physical resurrection, and then he went on to say, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Speaking of the eternal life that's true of every believer. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it's the cornerstone of the Christian faith. If there is no resurrection, then there's no Christian faith, there's no hope, there's no salvation, and there's no eternal life. And that's why this is so important. But in the first 10 verses, let's look at the fact of the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historical fact. It's based upon physical evidence, upon eyewitness testimony, and more important than those two, the word of God himself. It says in verse 1 of chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, as the first day began to dawn, it's now early Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. It was these two women who had witnessed the crucifixion of Christ firsthand and then from a distance watched Jesus being put in the tomb and they saw that large stone that was rolled across the tomb. And that was Friday before sundown. And this is now Sunday morning early, the third day since Jesus had been put in the grave on Friday. And the Jews count a partial day as a day. So it had been three days according to the Jewish accounting. And this is the day that Jesus promised his disciples that he would rise again from the dead. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Those stones that are circular, uh, anywhere from 8 to 12 feet across, across, weighing up to four tons, they're huge. Now, the angel didn't roll away the stone. He didn't open the grave to let Jesus out. The angel opened the grave to let people in to see that Jesus was no longer there. Jesus had, in fact, risen from the dead, and he was already not there. And evidently, he went right through the stone. There was something about the resurrected, glorified body of Jesus that was not true before the resurrection, not, not limited to the physical properties like yours and my bodies are. But he'd already risen from the dead and he was already gone. And notice this angel in verse 3. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing is white as the snow. So he's fresh from the presence of God and the glory of God's all over him. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I mean, what would you do in the presence of this, this, this <clears throat> heavenly creature, this being, and then this earthquake? They fell unconscious. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. So the angel knew why they came. They came to anoint his dead body. And the angel says, he is not here, for he is risen, as he said. And the emphasis in that sentence is on the fact that he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. So come see for yourself. The tomb is empty. And someone said, well, they didn't look. Are you kidding me? 
an angel from the presence of God with the glory of God all over him says, come and look, and you're, you're going to go, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. I don't know where people get this stuff. And go, notice verse 7, quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And so now fascination gives way to proclamation. See, you can't just hang around the tomb. You've got to go out with a message that he's risen. And that's the same message today, isn't it? Come and see. And once you've, once you've experienced the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation, then you go and tell. And if these women were taking notes, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ was all there. First of all, the empty tomb, the unconscious guards, a great earthquake, and then the angelic testimony, he's not here, he is risen, just as he said. And then there's the orderly grave clothes. The other gospel writers point this out. Now, if someone had stolen the body, like someone is to believe, the grave clothes would have been missing altogether or just ripped off the body and thrown everywhere. But they were lying perfectly the same way as when he was in them, sort of a cocoon shape of his body, only his body was gone. And the part that was wrapped around his head was folded neatly and laid in a corner. I guess the robbers just took time to do that just because they wanted to be nice. No, Jesus did it himself, and he wrapped the part, the cloth that was around his head and placed it in the corner. And then there's the explicit statement of Jesus himself fulfilled in the words of the angel, he is risen as he said. But all of the physical evidence, and the angel says in effect, you don't really have to take my word for it. Look what he says at the end of verse 7. Indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him, meaning with your own eyes, behold, I have told you. And of course, that's what they did. Matthew 28, 16, we'll look at next week. And the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed them. And that's where he gave them the great commission and sent them out. And it's as though the angel said, I've done my duty. I told you that he's risen. And then when your eyewitnesses, and when you see him in Galilee, then you go. And this is, a, of course, the fulfillment of something else that Jesus had said earlier back in Matthew 26, 32, before he was crucified. He says, after I've been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. And that's where he's going to meet them. But there's something important, even in, in the fact or the place of where he's going to meet them. He could have met them anywhere, but he does so in Galilee. And everybody there in the land of Israel at the time knew that Galilee was actually Galilee of the nations. It represented the world. And that's where Jesus would commission his disciples. Some of the Jews from Judea wouldn't even go there because that's where a lot of Gentiles live as well. But the idea, the message of the resurrection is to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean just because Jesus said, I'm going to meet you there, that he didn't, there weren't some appearances uh, to some of the other disciples before that because there were. On Resurrection Sunday, Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene at the grave. The other women then went on their way to tell the disciples, Peter and John, to come to the empty tomb and look in. And then he appeared at some point to Peter personally. And after that, Jesus appeared to two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus as they're walking along. And remember, he's telling them about himself through the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, and they still haven't figured out who it is until he sits down with them at supper, and then he breaks bread and gives it to them. And some wonder, did they see the, 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 you know, the, the wounds in his hands, his wrists from the crucifixion? But... He shows up as well that evening in the upper room where the disciples were hiding because they were afraid. And now as they said these things, Jesus stood. This is now Luke. Let me just read this to you. He said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified, supposing they had seen his spirit. And he said, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet. It is I, handle me and see, for a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones like you see me have. And when he had showed them this, his hands and his feet, while they stood, they still, it says, they didn't believe. 
And they marveled and said to him, have you any food here? He asked them, do you have any food? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence, proving that he was risen again from the dead in a literal physical body. They touched him, and he, he ate. So the angel of the tomb says to the women, he'll go before you into Galilee as I have told you. And these women, you can imagine what it was like for them not even thinking really about the resurrection, but going to the tomb after the third day. Why? Because that's when you anoint the body, because on the fourth day, it begins to decay. Didn't want that happening to the Lord, so they're honoring him. But their, their range of emotion, sympathy as they're going, and then terror when they get there, because they're frightened by this angel. And then now in verse 8, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and now great joy, and they ran to bring the disciples' word. So they went to tell the disciples what the angel said, the fact that the body's not there. By the way, when they made it to the disciples, who were now the apostles, uh, and told them what they had seen and heard, they didn't believe it. <laughs> they didn't believe it. And that's important because it affirms the fact that they didn't steal the body like others wanted us to believe. Because at this point, they don't even really believe in the resurrection. So why would they go through all the trouble of falsifying it? Well, they wouldn't. So off go the women to find the apostles. And when they find them, they can't even, con even convince them that it's true. Meanwhile, Mary Magdalene is on her way back to the grave with Peter and John. And the soldiers are there still unconscious. And the tomb is still open. And the angel's still there. And we pick up the story. Let me read to you from John, just to fill in the blanks here. John chapter 20, verse 4. They both ran together, and the other disciple, this is John, he never uses his own name. He only, in his writing, he calls himself the other disciple, outran Peter and came to the tomb first. It's always a competition, you know? <laughs> and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he didn't go in. And now Peter comes and blasts into the tomb. Then Peter, Simon Peter came, verse 6, following him. He went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and notice very carefully in verse 7, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not laying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. And you and I look at that and go, well, what well, big deal. He's, he's polite. You know, he came out of the grave clothes and and they were, they're laying there in sort of a shape of a cocoon. And then he takes, for what reason? I have no idea. Takes and lays it in a corner, neatly folded. Did you know that today, one of the things the Jews do in Israel is when they're at supper, that they go out to a fine restaurant and they're eating. And when they get up from the table and they mean to come back to the table so the waiter knows that they're coming back, what they do is they fold their napkin. Isn't that wonderful? You know what Jesus was saying to his disciples? I'm coming back. So, so Simon Peter blows in there, sees all of this. And then the other disciple, John, who came, he went in and he saw it, says, and believed. So his, his curiosity now changes to faith. They had heard Jesus tell him that, that they were gonna rise, he was going to rise again, but up to this point, it didn't compute. Now all the pieces began to come together, just like it did with us. One day, it made sense. I've heard this about Jesus. I've read this. Uh, I'm trying to put the pieces all together, and all of a sudden, God gives us the faith to believe, and now it's not curiosity anymore. It's faith. You guys remember that day when, you got, when, when it all came together and you got saved? For as yet, it says they didn't know the scriptures that he must rise again. It just didn't compute, though we told them several times. And now Mary stands outside the tomb and the other disciples go. They're not sure what to think. Jesus shows up and says, woman, why are you weeping? And she says this. This is in John who are you seeking? And she's supposing him to be the gardener. Can you believe that? Jesus shows up, resurrected, and she thinks he's the gardener. She said, sir, they've carried him away. Tell me where you've laid him, and I'll take him away. Proving again that, that they didn't know what had happened. They didn't steal the body. 
And Jesus said to her, Mary, it was at that instant when he used her name that she knew. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. It's, it's the most dignified term she could use. It's master. But Mary Magdalene, interestingly enough, was the first one to see the resurrected Jesus Christ. And she, you know, she grabbed onto him. She'd lost him once. She wasn't going to let it happen again. And Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. And now she takes off to go tell the rest of the disciples. And she came and told them that she'd seen the Lord and spoken to her. And they, they still didn't believe it. But here's the scene. This is when you put all the gospels together. The women have gone from the grave to tell the disciples what the angel said. And then Mary Magdalene Peter and John come to the tomb. Peter goes in first, then John goes in. Mary lingers around while they leave, and she's the first one to see the risen Lord, and now she leaves to go tell the disciples, and the other women are already on their way to tell the disciples, and then she's a bit behind them now, and after revealing himself to Mary, Jesus supernaturally transports himself out in front of the women who had gone earlier and meets them on the road, and they're walking by, and he says, this is in the Greek language, karate. Look at verse 9. That's where we pick it up again. And, she went to tell, and they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, rejoice. The Greek word is karate. You know what it means? Hi. I just think that's, I just, I crack up every time I read that because you'd think, here's the risen, glorified Lord. This is, this is thousands of years of history coming to pass, and he shows up and he's just, he just says, hi. <laughs> you'd think he'd have something more profound to say than hi. You know what that tells us, though? Even though Jesus Christ is now glorified, he still hasn't lost his human sensitivity he hasn't lost his human tenderness. He's heavenly for sure. He's God in human flesh, that's for sure. But he's also human and earthly, though glorified. He can commune with God the Father and with the holy angels because he's a son of God and he's God the Son. And at the same time, he can still walk along the dusty roads of life and have time for people like you and I. He says, hi, good morning, how are you? And then look at what it says in the rest of verse 9. And they, they held him by the feet and worshipped him. And so, so look at the range of emotions again with these women. First of all, sympathy. We're going to go and anoint him in the tomb. Uh, we don't know any better. And then fear because the angel's there. And then joy, hearing that Jesus had risen from the dead, not having seen him yet. And now they see him. And all of that turns to worship. And isn't that what happens to us? We hear about Jesus, we read some things about him, we're starting to put the pieces together, and we come to church and we see other people worshiping the Lord, we're not sure. I, you know, I feel different than I used to feel, it's sure good being here, isn't it? And then all of a sudden, all of that turns to worship, and then we find ourselves alongside of those that are worshiping him. I mean, what else do you do? We're holding on to him, just like they did, for dear life. The evidence is all there. The empty tomb, the earthquake... The unconscious soldiers, the grave clothes, the testimony of the angels. Uh, that's all strong evidence. It was all coming together in our hearts and minds, and now it's solidified by the actual presence of Christ, and they're holding on to him. Now they're eyewitnesses. He wasn't a figment of their imagination, he wasn't an apparition. This was not a spiritual resurrection, this was a resurrection in a literal, physical body, though different. It was Professor Thomas Arnold. He's the author of a three-volume history of Rome, also an appointed to the chair of modern history at Oxford University in England. This is what he said, quote, The evidence for our Lord's life, death, and resurrection may be and often has been shown to be satisfactory. It is good according to the common rules of distinguishing good evidence from bad evidence. Thousands. And tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece as carefully as every judge summing up a most important case. And he says that he's done it many times himself. 
And then he says, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidences than the great sign which God has given us that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead. They held him by his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. And now their hope is clear. They would see him in Galilee, just like the angel had told him, go and tell my brethren. Now, I wish that everybody would believe, but, but not everybody does. Amen? Look at verse 11 through 15. Now, this is the denial of the resurrection, which is a denial of tons of proof. Unbelief refuses to see and regard the evidence. And you remember being there, no matter what people said to you, you didn't want to hear it until one day, everything came together. Now, while they, that's these women, verse 11, were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. The earthquake, the angel, the fact that they fell down as though they were dead. And I thought to myself, why didn't they go to Pilate? Because they were Roman soldiers because they were under the penalty of death, had they gone to Pilate and said, we lost the prisoner, it, it was off with your heads. So they go to the religious leadership first, and when they, that is the chief priests, had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came by night and stole away, stole his body away while he sl we slept. Boy, none of that makes sense. This is the lie that proves the truth. And if this comes to the governor's ears, if Pilate hears about it, then we will appease him and make you secure. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, make, we'll think of something. An illegal arrest, an illegal trial, uh, uh, trumped up deceitful charges, now bribery, all of those things. And so they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. First of all, the last thing the disciples would have done was to steal the body. When they were crucifying Jesus, they, out of fear, all of them ran. You think they're going to come to a, a, a guarded tomb with all these Roman soldiers and steal the body? There's no way they would have done that. And why would they steal a body to falsify a resurrection that they didn't even believe or really even understand what happened? Secondly, if the guards were sleeping, then how did they know that somebody, and in particular, the disciples came and stole the body? Hey, do you know what you were doing or what went on in your room last night when you were sound asleep? No. None, none of this makes sense. And you know what? They have never found the body. You think they didn't try to look for it? Hey, we have to dissolve this thing real quick because the body's gone. Of course, they haven't looked in heaven. You think the disciples just made all this stuff up? I mean, James was sawn in half, believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He wouldn't recant that. Thomas had his brains beat out with a club. Peter was crucified upside down. John was boiled in oil. Another was speared in the back. They all went to their graves believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many of their families were, were killed. Their children were, were, were killed. Their wives were raped because they continued to preach the resurrection. You really think they all went to their graves and died for a lie? There's no way. And literally millions more throughout history have died. The Jews couldn't come up with a body. The Romans couldn't produce it. The disciples all died violent deaths and were certain of it. It's literally harder not to believe than it is to believe. But what does the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to us and for us? First of all, that the word of God is true. Absolutely true. Secondly, that Jesus is who he said he is. He's the son of God and he has power over death. Thirdly, it proves the salvation of all mankind is complete. He died for our sins, but he was raised again for our justification. God looks at us now who believe in Jesus Christ, and he declares us righteous. 
I love what Pastor Chuck Smith used to say. It's just as though we never sinned in God's eyes. He conquered sin, death, and hell. It also proves that judgment is coming because he's alive and coming back. And number five, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead guarantees the resurrection of all believers. If he didn't rise from the dead, do you think you are? <laughs> Did you know you can't really even be saved without believing in the resurrection? This is what Paul said, Romans 10, verse 9. If we confess that Jesus is Lord, well, what does that mean? That he's God in human flesh and everything the Bible says about him. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. My personal opinion is, if, if you say you believe in the resurrection and you also believe in reincarnation... I think something's missing. I don't think that's correct. I mean, some people want to believe in anything and everything. Those things are exclusive, mutually exclusive. Jesus rose again from a, in, in a literal physical body. The same body that went in the tomb was now glorified, and there was something different about him. And that same thing's going to be true for us who believe in Jesus Christ. Amen.